And, but welcome everybody. I already see that the Facebook page is getting a lot of views, which is great. And now jump right into it. I'll introduce you um, to Will, the virtual town hall, tell you quickly what we'll discuss. And then um, feel free to ask all of your questions in the chat on Facebook, on YouTube, everywhere where we're live. Uh, and Laura, who's also in um, the attendees on Zoom, will relay the questions so that Will can pick them up whenever he wants. Very good. Amazing. So just to introduce everyone to this virtual town hall, we're hosting those town halls every few, few weeks with people from all across the world as part of our Wave of Freedom campaign. So a few months ago, we started a campaign demanding that world leaders and democracies unite and work together to protect freedom fighters, democratic movements, but not only protect democracy, also innovate it. Um, so for example, we had one with Audrey Tang, who's the digital minister in Taiwan, to share best practices so that other countries can actually improve their democratic practices. And we've been holding them for quite a few months now. Um, we started our first one with Joshua Wong, the Hong Kong activist who's just been sentenced today. And this is when I think that this town hall is extremely important to have. Um, we've explored struggles for democracy all across the world from Hong Kong to Venezuela. Um, and the Vietnamese one is one that we haven't yet talked about. So that's why we invited Will. We think there's a huge educational value for all of the activists that now have from all over the world in learning more about it um, and also understanding how this plays in the broader um, trend that you have in Asia right now of very strong sh freedom struggles and movements happening um, and what we can all do across the world to support it. So I'm almost done speaking, I promise, but that's basically the context. Um, we received a lot of requests to have it on Vietnam and we directly thought of inviting Will. And he is a very strong um, figure of the Vietnamese democratic movement. He was um, himself detained in June 2018 um, after participating in a protest and he'll be able to tell you more about it. But he's been very, very vocal about pro-democracy um, in Vietnam, but not only in the border region. I've been following him on social media for a while. And so we thought that he would be the perfect person to join us. So welcome, Will. That's all from me. And um, I'll say one last word. My name is Colomb. I'm now's co-founder. And I'm also joined by Andrea, who's the other co-founder of now, who will jump on board right now. Thank you, Colomb, for this wonderful introduction. So now the mic will go directly to our guest. And my first question, Will, is for all of, you know, there are many people following us that might not be super familiar with the situation in Vietnam and um, maybe also the democratic history of the country. So if you can give a brief overview of what's going on and how this linked to past events, uh, it would be very useful. Yeah, for sure. Um, so when I speak to people about Vietnam, I think it's, it's, uh, it's useful to think of it as uh, a mini China, right? So both China and Vietnam are Marxist, Leninist, one party states, whereby um, the Communist Party controls all the apparatuses of power. Um, all media in the country is controlled by the state, the army, the, uh, by the party, the army is controlled by the party. Um, basically, any structure of power in society is controlled by a single party. And uh, other political parties are banned altogether, right? You have things like uh, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of assembly. These rights are guaranteed uh, in theory in the Vietnamese constitution, right? They're guaranteed by Article 25, but you know, these are largely aspirational and they're, they're mostly subservient to um, things like national security or stability and order, right? Which is nothing more than a euphemism for you know, the party's hold on power. Um, if you study Vietnamese history like I have since uh, 2004, I, I majored in East Asian studies at Yale. Um, so I, I studied Vietnam and China in, in, in great detail. I learned the languages, I studied the history of the politics, um, you know, taking in the background of both countries. And what you find is that in the 20th century, uh, Vietnam and China actually followed very similar trajectories in the sense that you had um, nationalists and communists duke it out in a civil struggle um, to, uh, to claim power over the entire country, right? So in 1949, you had um, the Chinese Communist Party uh, take over uh, China. And then in 1945, you had the Vietnamese Communist Party um, form their own state uh, based in northern Vietnam, right? And then you had decades of 
chaos and turmoil where they tried to impose um, their, their communist agenda, right? They tried to centralize the economy. They um, attacked intellectuals who tried to dissent. You had um, all these different trends where uh, the party consolidates its power, right? Only to realize after several decades that a centralized planned economy doesn't work, right? So in 1978, China opened up its uh, economy. It became uh, somewhat of a free market economy. The same exact thing happened in Vietnam in 1986. So you can see that there's this staggered effect whereby both communist parties take power and then realize that the ideology on which their party was founded doesn't work. So they, throughout the 20th century, have taken these steps to open up their economy, liberalize their economy, but uh, you know, refuse to politically liberalize. Um, so where we are today, uh, I would say China and Vietnam are pretty much in the same boat in the sense that you, you don't really have a democracy movement, right? Because the party will immediately stamp out um, any effort at organizing. Um, so that's, that's where we are. I mean, uh, you know, you had the recent arrest of, of Tham Dong Jiang. She was Vietnam's um, most prominent dissident, you know, for the last five, 10 years. And, you know, right before this party Congress, um, you have uh, a very predictable crackdown. So it's every five years when the Vietnamese Communist Party elects new leaders, um, you have these kinds of crackdowns that essentially, you know, wipe out as much of any kind of budding democracy movement as possible. And so, first of all, thank you for the background. I think a lot of people are not aware of how closely, um, of how it looks very close to, you know, what's happening in China at the moment. And one of my questions was actually going to be around the January um, Congress from the Communist Party. How did you get involved in it? Because in 2018, as I said, I think you got arrested, right, after a protest. So how did you decide to get involved in this pro-democracy movement in the first place? Well, my public involvement in the movement started out with a bang, right? It was, you know, Vietnamese police caught on tape assaulting me on the streets of Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and it became a bit of a diplomatic event because I was an American citizen. Uh, you know, Vietnamese police were caught on tape um, assaulting a foreigner. And it just became this um, bit of an event where you had to, you know, American lawmakers and diplomats had to get involved to um, secure my release. I ended up being in prison for a little over 40 days. I was tried, um, you know, went through the court system. Um, tried and convicted of disturbing public order and then deported, right? But what a lot of people don't know is I've been doing, you know, the due diligence for participat participation in the Vietnamese democracy movement for, you know, like more than 10 years. I majored in East Asian studies in undergrad. And then when I went um, for higher education, I chose uh, Singapore because it was close to Vietnam. And I chose public policy because that was the subject that would get me closest to uh, political reform in Vietnam, right? If I wanted to pursue some kind of change in the country, studying public policy would, would be a very good fit. Um, so, you know, it's things like learning the language, learning Vietnamese even, you know, because I grew up um, not really speaking Vietnamese that well. I didn't know how to read or write it, but I learned it in college. I studied several years of Vietnamese, studied several years of Mandarin Chinese. You know, you, you, you observe, you observe, you observe, you take in as much context as you can before you make any kind of decisive action. And that's exactly what happened, or that's exactly what I did, right? I had graduated from, you know, public policy school in Singapore that May, and in June, the next month, I was actually in Vietnam to look for a job because I wanted to study there, I wanted to settle there long term. Um, and then the protest broke out and, and the rest is history. We just got a question, thank you for this. I think it helps as a background for people to understand why and how you get involved because I think one of the issues with pro-democracy struggles is often it feels like, you know, it's exceptional people that are incredibly brave. And for sure, a lot of the people are incredibly brave and exceptional individuals. But I think, you know, what creates change and social movements in the first place is just people deciding that it's the right thing to do and ending up um, going to one protest or standing up for something and then stuff kind of happens slowly. So that's why I always ask this question, how did you start? Um, no, I think I think it's a very good, uh, good question. I think it's it's fair too. I mean, for a lot of overseas Vietnamese like myself, I was born in the states, so I was born as a result of the Vietnam War. Right, I was born. Um, my parents had escaped Vietnam by boat 
1979 because our family was affiliated with um, the South Vietnamese regime. So the new communist government essentially blacklisted us and you know we weren't able to find jobs. Um, you couldn't go to school. I mean, you were essentially cut off from the new society, right? So you had a huge exodus uh, in the late 70s and early 80s whereby over a million Vietnamese escaped the country by boat. Uh, my parents uh, were among uh, that group. So for me growing up, you know, I would hear Vietnamese at home, but I would never really understand, you know, why uh, that part of my identity was never explored more. And it wasn't until college that I realized it was because of trauma, right? My parents went through so much trauma, you know, escaping the country by boat to provide us a better life. So as I studied the history of, of Vietnam more, you, you learn why you end up in a certain place. You, you learn about historical injustices and you try to figure out ways to fix them, right? So for me, I learned that the whole idea of Vietnam War, the, or the, the whole reason why North and South Vietnam fought one another was because they were both fighting to impose, you know, their version of what Vietnamese society should look like, right? But the underlining thing that um, both countries had in common at the time was democratic ideals. Both Vietnamese in North Vietnam and South Vietnam wanted things like freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. Um, these were things that the Vietnamese had fought for even, uh, you know, during French colonial times, right? So Vietnam was a French colony uh, in the 1800s up to about 1945. So for about 80 years, uh, Vietnam fought against the French to free themselves, right? So it's like you had this long tradition of Vietnamese fighting for these democratic traditions only for new authoritarian governments to take over and then repeat the cycle. So for me, getting involved was a way, of, uh, was a form of historical justice, right? Historical rectification. If I could help Vietnam, you know, I'm a result of something unfortunate, the war and then the boat people exodus. If I can make up for that in some way, if I could help the Vietnamese actually achieve the democratic ideals that millions have died fighting for, then that's something that I should do. That's, I mean, it's an incredible, powerful story, I think. And we already have a lot of questions in the chat on your personal story, which we'll jump to in just a second. Um, but when we asked you the first question, you said it's kind of a cycle. Every five years or so, there's a crackdown um, before um, the Communist the party Cong Yeah, the, the Communist yeah. Party's Congress. Um, yeah. I wanted to know, how come... Because again, for a lot of us, this is not something that is intrinsically natural, right? Like before yeah, yeah. The elections, I wouldn't, or before yeah. party Congress, I wouldn't assume that there would be a crackdown. So why do you think it happened just before? Is it not something that is happening throughout the five years? Um, you know, how come a year before, I think it's politicians, journalists, and human rights defenders, basically, that get arrested, yeah. and yeah. so on. Absolutely. Well, it's like, it's kind of like, I mean, think of it as like a party, right? Like if you are organizing a party and you know that there's a group of people who might cause you trouble, who might organize and disrupt the event, then you obviously want to put them away right before the event, right? They're free to, you know, make noise and cause trouble during other times, but during the special ceremony whereby you have like the new leadership step up, you want it to be as disruption free as possible. So that's why it tends to repeat um, in that five year pattern. And the next, the next uh, Congress is in January, right? It's just coming up right now. Correct. Yeah, yeah, early next year. And so last question on what kind of what is happening and then we'll start getting more personal in a way, but um, mm -hmm. what, what are the, do you still see a lot of protests right now in Vietnam? Because obviously the international attention is way more focused on, for example, Thailand or Hong Kong at the moment. And Laura asked a question in the chat about this. How come we're not hearing more about Vietnam? How come we don't know what's happening? So do you see a lot of... Um, protests at the moment or is it or are protests completely being cracked down upon because of of the congress happening no I, I would say well because of covid people aren't organizing in big groups anymore right but also protests in vietnam are exceedingly rare and it has to be a very very it has to touch on a very very sensitive issue for people to um to rally organize and actually take to the streets right because they people in vietnam know that the 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 police state apparatus is quite strong and if you are caught, um, you know, politically organizing or agitating against the state, these, these 
crimes come with jail sentences of at least, you know, a decade. So it's, it's an egregious amount of time and the punishments are purposefully disproportionate to discourage this kind of political organizing, right? So these things are, are, are very, very rare, which is why um, when protests broke out in June of 2018, that was such a huge event. That was probably the largest uh, political upheaval that Vietnam has experienced since the war ended in 1975, right? It was protests that broke out in all major cities across Vietnam. You had them in Hanoi, um, Saigon, Vung Tau, like you had, it was just across the entire country because the National Assembly was considering two laws, right? One was a cybersecurity law, and then another law was uh, going to establish three special economic zones across the length of the country. And what the Vietnamese people feared was that these special economic zones would be leased by Chinese investors, right? which is not an unrealistic expectation, um, given how close China is. Um, so a lot of people, it, it, it touched on Vietnamese people's knee-jerk fear of uh, the Chinese taking over, plain and simple. So then people hit the streets and they voiced their discontent and the National Assembly uh, ended up withdrawing the Special Economic Zones Law altogether. Thanks so much, Will. I think that this background is super interesting for, for us. And actually, I would ask you one more question on, um, because you draw a lot of parallels between Vietnam and China. And I know that a lot of our audience, because of the campaign we launched, especially focused on Hong Kong, is way more familiar with the Chinese uh, case and example. Um, right. So what are the differences between what's going on in China and Vietnam? And this to tie with the question that Laura put in the chat, because obviously we hear way more speaking about China, probably because of its economic influence. Um, but what are the similarities and differences between the two systems of governance and also like their internal and foreign policy? Yeah, um, and that's a good question. There's a huge disparity in how much you know, the world pays attention to either country. And this has to do with, you know, simply the size of the country, right? Vietnam has 100 million people. China has 1.4 billion people now, I believe it is. So Vietnam is less than a tenth the size of China. So obviously, events in China will be covered more, right? I think in the global consciousness, Vietnam is associated with war. And that's the extent of it, right? Vietnam has generally kept a low profile. Um, ever since. I mean, it, it's seen as like a, a cheaper manufacturing hub. Um, but other than that, I mean, what reason do people have to care about Vietnam? If Vietnam democratizes or not, it's not necessarily going to affect people around the world the way, you know, Chinese democratization would, right? So it's, it has to do with, with scale, plain and simple. It's, China is a much, much bigger country. Um, Chinese actions are much more visible. It, it, it affects a lot more countries. You know, China has uh, global projects like the Belt and Road Initiative. Vietnam has no such thing, right? It, it, it's, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a size thing. And also Vietnamese leaders aren't quite as ambitious. Vietnamese leaders will focus on internal stability um, and, you know, try to broaden their, their international relations, but they, they don't have the kind of um, hegemonic or expansionist uh, goals the way China does, right? China wants to be number one, whereas Vietnam is limited by its geography, its size, uh, its population. It doesn't have these kinds of, 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 of lofty global aspirations. So you, there's naturally less interest. But as you said, though, a lot of people had to flee after the war, right? Including your parents mm -hmm. and you ended up in yeah. the U.S. I mean, you were born in the U.S. and a lot of mm -hmm. people. So I'm sometimes surprised that, you know, with such a big yet community abroad, um, this is a topic that doesn't come up whatsoever. Like as you know, it comes up in the news once in a while, like your arrest, for example, I saw came up on BBC and so on. I think it's mm -hmm. due also to the fact that you're American and to the police violence, but it's, there's really very little international attention on the matter. And considering the fact that, you know, we talk of the multi alliance right now, we talk about the broad struggle for freedom and democracy across Asia from Hong Kong to Thailand. I'm always yep. surprised that we don't see more of um, what is happening in Vietnam. And that's also what we're trying to do with this town hall, is to make people more aware um, of this in the first place. Well, um, I know in, in, in the US, um, you know, Vietnamese Americans have been largely pressured to assimilate, right? They, they've been pushed by their parents to do well in American society and not necessarily focus on the past too much. So in, in a sense, I'm, I'm one of the, the few who 
say, learned the language or studied Vietnam's history, you know, I, I, I look towards the past to kind of figure out my own future, right? But for a lot of Vietnamese, they just look forward. They, they you know, speak English at home and they don't particularly care about, you know, Vietnamese culture beyond like pho or bun mi, right? So it's very like uh, surface level stuff. They don't, they don't necessarily care to get to know Vietnamese history uh, in a deeper sense. But also I would say that, that, you know, there's still internal debates going on in overseas Vietnamese communities about what the best way to, you know, deal with the Vietnamese, deal with the communist government, right? You have one side that, that preaches reconciliation and I'm, and I'm on that side, right? But then you have another uh, more confrontational side that wants to overthrow the communist government. And that's something that I just don't think is um, politically sustainable, right? So even within overseas Vietnamese communities, there's a, there's a huge amount of internal debate that goes on about um, what the best way forward is. And I think with younger generations, particularly with my, gen my generation and, and Gen Z, for example, we definitely sit more on the side of reconciliation. We want to work with the, the current Vietnamese government to improve things for, for, for Vietnamese on the ground. We don't, unlike you know, my parents' generation, we don't want to overthrow the regime. We don't want um, more violence for the, the Vietnamese. Just, sorry, I just have a follow-up question then on this before. I, I know Andrea wants to ask some of the questions in the chat, but do you think that working with the current government that is cracking down on, on rights and democracy is possible? Do you have hope that this can actually lead to more democracy? I think it's a question that a lot of people ask themselves and it will be linked to the Thai question that we'll get in just a second from Andrea. Um, but how do you work with governments that are so, um, that crack down so much on rights and democracy? Is it even possible? Yeah, I, I think it helps to not think of the Communist Party as some kind of monolithic organization, right? Because you actually do have different factions within the party and some are more liberal, some are more conciliatory than others. So I think um, part of the work is connecting with these more moderate members of the party, right? Why do I suggest that? Because in Eastern Europe, um, when the Soviet empire was collapsing and you had the fall of communism there, a, a big part of an effective strategy for democracy advocates was linking up with moderates within the parties themselves, right? So moderate activists and moderate party members um, connected and then sidelined all the extremists and this this newly formed group was then able to reform the government in a largely peaceful way, right? So there are lessons um, from Eastern Europe that us Vietnamese can take in um, to push for, for greater change. Um, in terms of the alternative, that's what we've been doing for the last 30 years. This is why I, I, I would like to try the more conciliatory approach because we have been so adversarial with the Vietnamese government and they dig in their heels when, you know, they feel under attack, right? I mean, you have so much uh, Vietnamese resources going towards just maintaining this enormous police state. And that money could be going elsewhere. It could be going to, you know, helping Vietnamese learn English. It could be, it'd be going to so many different causes, you know, infrastructure, schools, all that jazz. Because that adversarial relationship has been kept up for so long, you had such a huge waste of money and mental energy that the communist government could have been devoting elsewhere. So I think, you know, us overseas Vietnamese do have to take some responsibility for maintaining this adversary relationship. And I'm hoping with my generation that we change tack a bit. Thank you so much, Will. I think it's very uh, eye-opening for many, many of us because I think that many campaigns that we're pushing for uh, are in, a, in the same situation, right? From Hong Kong to Belarus, there's always this, um, you know, difficult struggle whether like to fight, to overthrow, or more like try to find partners even in yeah. the establishment, as some would say. Um, I really like one of the questions we received here, here on Zoom from Perada. I will summarize it for um, our Facebook audience. Basically, Perada is a, is a, um, a Thai activist. Sorry if I mispronounce your name. Um, and basically, he's asking Will, um, what can we do uh, for in Thailand to continue the fight? Because obviously, it might be a lengthy fight. It might be a very difficult one. Um, the dictatorship is strong. People are getting discouraged. So from Will's experience, how can we keep on going? How can we 
mobilize people and uh, overcome the difficulties that we are facing? Yeah, that's uh, definitely a very good question. It's a difficult one because I, I mean, you know, I'm we're struggling with the same issues in Vietnam. We 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 don't even have the kind of robust movement that Thailand has, right? But you know, what is the alternative? Is it the alternative just throwing in the towel and settling for an authoritarian regime? I ju I just don't think there there is necessarily a choice in the matter, right? You you fight to the end. I think the important thing, and I think this, this is what democracy movements have to focus on, is that we have to, in order to keep an authoritarian government in check, you have to function like the institutions that the country is either lacking um, uh, or has a very uh, weak form of, right? So democracy movements should function like, say, a free press. It should get information out um, objective, truthful information out as, as much as possible. It should also function like a robust civil society. It should unite different groups uh, into coalitions to put pressure on the government to behave in certain ways. It should act like a, a, a loyal political opposition, right, to push the government to be better. So it's, I think it's these three functions that, that democracy movements have to just continually focus on. Democracy itself is, is a process, right? Even in democratic societies, democracy constantly has to be defended against. It has to be protected. And it's these three institutions that keep the Leviathan from, from escaping its cage. That's very true. It's something we do protest every Friday for democracy. And it's something that we often discuss, you know, how we always talk about Hong Kong, or about those struggles that are, that seem so big, just because they're in front of such a big authoritarian state, but it's not like all other countries have perfect democratic system. I'm exactly. fine. Right now, democracy is under attack in France, just like it is in every single country across the world. Democracy is never won. It always remains to be won. And we all have to work for it. And I think it links very well with a question that Quinn, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name as well, um, has, which is um, summarizing it as well for people who are not on the Zoom uh, conference. This person is saying that in Vietnam, one of the issue is that people sometimes lack political awareness and awareness of different ideas and ideologies. So they don't necessarily know a lot about democracy um, and different political systems. Um, and so Quinn is asking, moving forward, what do you think we can do to address this issue of political awareness, open conversation, et cetera? And I think you partially answered this already, but if you want to bounce on it, it would be great. No, I, I, yeah. So uh, I think one thing that democracy advocates, Vietnamese democracy advocates and the Vietnamese government, the one thing we do agree on is that the groundwork for democracy in Vietnam is not there, right? And this uh, has to do with the fact that civic education in Vietnam the last 30, 40 years has been completely lacking. Um, I think the government, you know, makes it a point to not teach about um, the structures of government, who their leaders are, they keep things purposefully opaque because it's easier to hold on to power this way. So a lot of native Vietnamese activists that I speak to, and Quinn is correcting this, they lack even the most basic, the most fundamental of political knowledge, right? Different types of government, um, what democracy is, what democratic institutions are, um, on a personal level, I've tried to remedy this by, so I worked with an organization in the Asia Pacific. Um, I worked with Voice and actually taught a Politics 101 course um, for native Vietnamese activists, right? Essentially like filling them in on, you know, the basics of government. And I, and I taught it like the way uh, you would teach like a high school government course, right? Because in Vietnam, they don't have high school government courses. Um, so I think we have to start by imparting of finding a way to impart this kind of very basic political knowledge. And I think the internet is super helpful with that in the sense that my generation and Gen Z have grown up with the internet for most, if not all of our lives, right? So if you really wanted to figure out how your society worked or figure out what alternative forms of government you could have, you know, it's a click away. And a lot of, a lot of young Vietnamese have have started doing this. And it's, it's really, really encouraging to see because then they start investigating their own histories. They start figuring out why, you know, the systems in Vietnam are as corrupt as they are, why Vietnam has such a pervasive police state, for example. So it's, it's, it's going to be a long process for sure. I mean, I'm, you know, we're going to be doing this for the next 20, 30, 40 years. It's going to be generational change stuff, but it's discussions like this and, and, and organizations like yours, help move the ball along, right? You have Vietnamese 
um, inside the country, you know, international citizens checking in and, and figuring out, you know, we need to talk about this more. We need to defend democracy more. We need a, a, a higher political consciousness. Um, completely agree. Do you think, because we, as we mentioned a lot, Hong Kong has been on top of the news for so long now, and I think the Thai struggle for democracy has been quite on top of the news as well. Do you feel like this is helping creating this political awareness, the fact that countries in the region are going through this process? Do you think that the news is, is slowly creating a sense of, you know, um, a want for democracy, a hope for democracy in Vietnam? Absolutely. Um, especially in Vietnam. I mean, people were following the, the Hong Kong protests quite closely. Um, and, you know, even though media in Vietnam is largely controlled by the state, you had a lot of um, subversive journalists who would try to impart organizing knowledge to the general public, right? So, uh, you know, they were, state media journalists are told to cover the Hong Kong protests in like a non-favorable way, right? But what they would end up doing is they would end up publishing uh, how these protesters organized in, 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 a, in a subversive way in the sense that they were like, don't do these things, and then proceed to list all the organizing uh, activities in it's great detail. Right, so it's like they subverted the entire system and imparted this knowledge to the general public, you know, within the confines of of this, this state media conglomeration. I thought it was it was quite genius on their part, but um, the thirst is definitely there for greater political organization, and you know, young journalists, even from within the system, are finding ways to pass the knowledge to the general public. So there's I hope. Love, I love when states do that, when they just try yeah. to explain to you what you shouldn't be doing, and as a result, they yeah. exactly how to do it. It happens yes. in every system, whether it's, you know, gay rights, women's rights, democratic struggles, and so on. The do not do is basically a guide on how to protest effectively against the government. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's super smart. Like it, it was a genius stroke, and, and it's that kind of creativity and ingenuity that, that gives me so much hope for any kind of future democracy movement in Vietnam. And thank you, Will. I want to ask you a question that might interest our international audience. And because we you know as a movement, we always try to support struggles from outside um, as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, we do that by applying pressures sometimes on governments, institutions, politicians, and so on. And I read, um, I remember actually from 2019, that the EU signed a free trade agreement with Vietnam that was highly debated back then, and then obviously with other. COVID and other things completely got forgotten. Um, mm, yeah. And I want to know from you, what's your take on such, su such a, a position of the EU? Because obviously on one side, it might create some economic uh, benefits for the Vietnamese population. On the other side, it probably strengthen and give credibility to the, the current regime. So right. as a Vietnamese, what, what do you think that is the right thing to do? And what can we do if we should try to stop it, for example? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit torn on that. And I, I think, you know, the, the EU um, MPs, you know, they had good intentions when they signed this free trade agreement, right? They, I think they abide by a very simplistic form of modernization theory, whereby they think like, you know, more trade and greater economic prosperity will open up the system, right? It'll bring about the conditions to um, democratize. The problem is that you have the rise of China, who's presenting, you know, an alternate model. China economically liberalizes, it opens up its markets, you know, you have this good uh, economic growth that's, that's occurring, but then they keep a very tight lid on political opposition, right? They, they will crush any kind of um, political organizing. So it's, not, it's no longer necessarily the case that greater economic prosperity will bring about um, greater calls for democracy. You, you, you have the state that's shocking to be number one now demonstrating that free trade will not necessarily bring about democratization. Um, you know, greater economic prosperity will not necessarily bring about um, calls for democracy. So, I mean, it's hard to say, right? It's, you hope that when people become richer, they focus on, you know, these more abstract things like greater freedoms and, and you have, you know, a shift in values, but that is no longer necessarily the case because you you are now facing down this extremely harsh and punishing apparatus. Um, Vietnam takes a lot of its cues from China in that sense. Um, so while you have you know 
I think Vietnam just hit 90,000 uh, US dollars uh, per capita in terms of GDP, right? I think this was a few weeks ago that the prime minister announced that um, Vietnam, was, Vietnam was now hitting 9,000. 9, so, I mean, you're already, Vietnam's already in the zone. It's already in the you know, ac academically established transition zone for democracy, but it's not happening. You're not really seeing any kind of shift towards democracy. And China has been in the transition zone for, for years now, but again, because of this overwhelming police state apparatus, it's tamping any kind of democratic forces from developing further. So I, I would say the EU is, EU MPs are abiding by outdated knowledge, which is why I personally oppose um, the EF uh, FTA because it's, there was no kind of enforcement mechanism, right? Yeah. I mean, Vietnam has signed so many international covenants to guarantee these kinds of human rights, to guarantee um, basic democratic freedoms, but I mean, Vietnam has been punishing its dissidents for decades and the EU goes and signs this agreement. What message does that send? It sends the message that essentially the EU is feckless, right? It's not really gonna do anything um, to punish Vietnam. And I think- um, and that, Go ahead. No, no, I'll go for it and finish, sorry. No, and that's why I was really happy to, to see today that um, uh, Safeguard Defenders, which is a, a international human rights organization, it published um, Tham Duong Jiang's last work, which is a, a Vietnamese book uh, centered on the Magnitsky Act, yeah, teaching Vietnamese how to pursue uh, Magnitsky Acts against their own government officials, right? So it's, it's a way to um, sanction officials that would otherwise just get away scot-free. I think what you touched upon as well, of you know, the outdated data and values is very interesting. It would be an entire of a town hall that I'd be very happy to have, but it's you know, we tend to think, especially in the West, I think that once people achieve a certain standard of living or, you know, after a certain phase happens, they will automatically want democracy because it's right, logical. Right. But yeah. we see, and you said it, with China, we see that this is not happening. The mm -hmm. newest generation in China is less pro-democracy than the older one. We see yeah. that it's not something that people aspire to. And obviously there's a competing model that is somehow working for some people in China. But I think there's also an... an failure of democratic countries to propose an appealing model in a way we've been holding on to the same ideas of democracy we haven't really been and i like the term sexy for it but you know sexifying it in a way or like dating it with new trends and so on and i'm yeah. saying this because we talked a lot we have a lot of taiwanese activists for example at now and they constantly come with ideas of how to improve democracy how to make it more participatory how to make it more digital and so on how to appeal to the younger generation and it's yeah. something that a lot of democracies aren't taking into account. They're not reviewing their standards. They're not bettering the process. And um, they're just assuming that the current status quo is working. And I think it's not working, one, for their population, but it's also not inspiring outside of their own countries in a way. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. And on this note, we got a question from Facebook of, um, so very hard <laughs> question. I think it's a very key one. And um, what can the international community do to support Vietnam? We cannot stay silent on this topic any longer. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, if this chat is any indication, just getting the information out there uh, is a huge part of it, right? Functioning like the free press that Vietnam doesn't have. Because, inter I've, you know, I've spoken to a lot of native Vietnamese activists. And international recognition, international knowledge is enormously galvanizing, right? You have a people who are living under this oppressive state. It helps them mentally so much to know that the world knows what's going on and is attempting you know to do things about it attempting to, to pressure uh, government officials to to change their ways right so i would say getting the knowledge out there is huge and you know once covid passes and borders open up again i would say a big part of it is just engaging ordinary vietnamese um, in conversation right figuring out um, what's beneath the surface. Vietnam is such a beautiful tourist destination, but oftentimes um, you don't scratch the things below the surface and that tends to worsen the situation in the long term. It, it, it legitimizes this government in a way, right? If you don't address um, the shortcomings. Um, yeah, it's, it's oh man. I, I mean, I understand it's hard not to get discouraged um, and I think that's something that, that, that I have to you know contemplate myself right but 
I mean, you got to run on what knowledge, hope. You just have to keep working. But for me, there's no other choice. Like even in you know seeing Joshua Wong and and Angus Chow and all of them, you know, seeing them go to prison and knowing that Pham Dong Jang is in prison, right? You you work for them. There there is no other path to take but to just keep going and know that you you tried even in the face of overwhelming odds. There there's no other choice to take. Yeah, completely agree with you. And I mean, we also think. Personally, like as an organization that democratic countries should do more. Uh, for example, we are advocating a lot for the creation of an international coalition uh, of democracies that can, you know, sanction regimes that crack down on freedom fighters. So obviously Hong Kong is a perfect example, but I think that Vietnam would be another one. And we're pushing for this motion to be um, discussed or voted in the upcoming G7 in, um, in this summer in, uh, in the UK. So at least yeah. even if the G7 doesn't comprise obviously all democracies in the world, it could be a nucleus, a start uh, for you know, countries like mine, I'm Italian, uh, Italy is extremely silent on human rights viola violation from, from China or other countries because it's, the country is deadly scared of the economic consequences of speaking up. You know, what's going on in Australia right now, for example, with Australia being completely bashed by China and losing um, economic prosperity because of it. But we believe right. that if you actually create a, a coalition that can you know, um, super, stand better uh, against economic threats and also uh, maybe support each other, maybe these are a potential solution. Um, what do you think, Will, about this kind of like international coalition? Do you think there's something that we should push for also for the case of Vietnam? Or maybe because it's history, it's better to avoid it. No, no, no. I think the idea of like a new liberal order is definitely a very good one. I was just reading an article in, in, in Foreign Policy about this very idea. Um, and I definitely think it has a better chance of getting off the ground with, you know, Biden elected, right? I, I didn't have very much hope for any kind of new liberal order with Trump at the helm, just because, I mean, he was a man that just completely disregarded all democratic norms and that was going around the world praising authoritarian leaders, right? I think with Biden in office, um, you know, taking a stronger stance against China is something that's bipartisan. You have support um, for this idea from both Democrats and Republicans. Um, so if, I mean, I think the idea of a new liberal order is, is smart, but um, what is that gonna look like? How, how, how are we gonna enforce, um, you know, sanctions against China when so many of us are, you know, economically, tied to China in such existential ways, right? I mean, even with Vietnam, I remember when I was in prison and our interrogation session was over, I was just having um, a casual chat with the party member and you could tell that, you know, the Communist Party wants to move away from China. It wants to be seen as, you know, a nationalist organization to kind of build up its legitimacy, but it knows the country is so intimately tied with China that any kind of movement away or, or you know any kind of antagonism will uh will hurt vietnam very badly right so i think we have to figure out um to what extent this new liberal order can punish china and if we do punish china what will that look like and how will that affect us what kind of blowback will we get yeah and i think you know obviously i think vietnam is kind of an extreme case of its link with china but it's we saw after the, the introduction of the national security law the number of countries who spoke out against it and there was a map made of the investments of the Belt and Road Initiative from China and mm -hmm. who spoke out against it. And you could yep. directly see that yeah. when you had the Belt and Road Initiative, countries just stayed silent. So Italy was extremely silent on this, for example. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Other countries were a bit more outspoken. And this is our idea in general. It's, you know, it's not just for China. Our idea of the League of Democracies is to um, protect democracy, but also innovate it, as I said, so sharing best practices and so on. But with yeah, the idea yeah. that if countries do come together and impose coordinated sanctions, for example, on certain officials and so on, the backlash will be less strong because then you can also have stronger economic ties between those countries. And the case of Australia is obviously, you know, a 30% tariff on wine. Um, and yeah. if you have stronger ties with other countries, it's a, it's, it can be um, a bit easier. And Andrea mentioned the G7, but we definitely also want to go beyond. For example, Taiwan could be a very interesting country to work with on such an idea, considering it's, um, role right now and how it's being dismissed often in international organizations. 
I see, for the sake of time, I see a lot of questions in the chat and we have <laughs> and 10 minutes left. So we'll try to ask as many as possible within a short time frame. I'm sorry, everyone, if we can't get them all done. I'm sure that Will will be happy to answer it on on the, the Facebook video or so on as well. Um, but Michael, I'm picking this one because I don't think he, he spoke yet, said piggybacking on the last question, what should the incoming Biden administration do when in power? And I'm guessing it's linked to, sorry, the part on, um, you know, international sanctions, um, international coalition for democracy and so on. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, consistency is number one, right? We have to adopt, you know, a general strategy to, to show China that we don't approve of its authoritarian behaviors, right? I think that's something that's been um, very much lacking during the Trump administration. They largely looked the other way, um, you know, when China was cracking down on, on Hong Kong's dissidents, right? So it, I think there needs to be more, um, more vocalizing from the top leadership. Um, I mean, because I, again, and it goes back to economics, it, I think we just need to, we need to branch out, right? We were so dependent on China right now for, for imports that, you know, we can, we can only say so much uh, to China, but I mean, if they, if they say it's an internal affair, which they're, that they're doing with Hong Kong, um, what, what mechanisms do we have to, to, to buck that trend? Um, yeah, I mean, your guess is as good as mine at this point. I'm just relieved that we have new leadership. And I think a lot of us are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, still in the incubation phase in terms of, um, what we would like to see out of the Biden administration, what actions they can take. I think now, um, can contribute productively to this conversation as well. I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm a bit mentally exhausted, I would say. It's a tough one, yeah. <laughs> um, I actually want to take another question from the chat because I think that since you are asking very easy questions, <laughs> I want another one that is uh, very challenging for you, Will. Uh, I think I'm Queen sorry Anne, in advance, by the way, for all of those exactly, questions. Very tough question. No, 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 no. no, no. Very tough <laughs> uh, we have a question on how basically to tie the um, international labor struggle with the democratic struggle. So the idea that there are um, a lot of, you know, these human rights infringement in, in, in Vietnam and so on are often falling also on the working class and like the work and ri workers' rights. And that's, for example, definitely something that the free trade agreements with Europe uh, only worsen because clearly Vietnam stays competitive when, you know, it stays extremely cheap. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this, as a consequence, might imply lower and lower protection uh, for workers. So, I mean, this is a very difficult question, but did you ever think, or maybe in your experience in the streets of Vietnam, um, do you see uh, mobilization from workers groups or is always uh, more like foreigner minded people um, or so on? No, no, no. I mean, Vietnam definitely has its own domestic labor movement. Um, I mean, that's, that's also cracked down upon um, because, you know, the, the Communist Party, they're also students of history, right? So they know about solidarity and in Poland and they know how. And so after the Soviet Union fell, a lot of party members, you know, studied Eastern European countries in depth and figured out, you know, why communism fell so quickly in this country. So the, you know, these historical lessons are actually um, very well known. And the labor movement is uh, another vulnerability for them. So they've cracked down on that um, in equal measure. Um, a positive development that happened though is that um, in signing, I think it was either the uh, EFTA or it was another trade agreement, but um, Vietnam essentially agreed to allow um, independent labor unions, um, which is a, a first, right? Usually you have some kind of um, party participation in a kind of um, domestic labor movement, but this was um, Vietnam agreeing to independent labor unions to the, ex uh, but to what extent we don't yet know because the law doesn't go into effect until 2021. Um, so it remains to be seen how independent um, the Vietnamese Communist Party will allow these labor unions to go, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. Thank you so much, Will. I think that this answer um, a lot of the question in the chat. So I'm 
personally really happy about <laughs> with your answer and I don't want to keep on like bombing with questions. And um, so my, I would ask you if you want to um, give a final statement, a final word uh, to people listening. Um, and as I said, on Facebook, we have a lot of activists that uh, participate in our campaigns. So if you have a final word for them, it would be super appreciated. Um, I think, <laughs> so I'm, I'm currently reading um, Barack Obama's new memoir, right? And, and it's about, you know, the currents of history and, and how you face up to um, forces that you feel like are overwhelming and completely out of your control. Um, but the key message for me has always been uh, hope, right? It's, it's hope for a better future. It's hope that the next generation will have slightly more political knowledge. It's hope that the next generation will want a slightly better life, better lives for themselves than the previous generation. It's, it's less fear, more hope, less fear. And you know, from working with Vietnamese democracy activists in the last couple of years, um, I have so, so much hope because you, you have these young, bright Vietnamese who are very visibly afraid. Um, you know, they attend my classes and they use pseudonyms, right? They never use the real names. Nobody knows who anybody else is in the room, but they have taken this step to come and participate in this political class. And, you know, it's, it's these kinds of, um, it's you see the destruction of fear like before your eyes right and it's it's going to be a slow process it's going to take decades but like brock says and it's resonated with me since 2006 7 8 you know hope will always conquer fear i mean that's a perfect way to end it and i think regardless of people's political ideologies or allegiances and um, there is something that we all need to hope for a better future to be able to work for it. If we don't have hope, we're not going to be able to change anything because we'll all be very demoralized. And I think something that gives us hope at now on a daily basis is the fact that we see people from all countries coming together and working together, even when it doesn't directly impact them. So I see a lot of people on Facebook commenting and in this chat on Zoom, um, you know, sending, literally people are say, saying, sending all hopes and strength towards you. And, and so on. And this person, it gives me a lot of hope that if we manage to come together, regardless of our nationalities, time zones, I know that for Pirata, she said that it was very, very late for her, for example, and she just commented this. And I have hope that we'll manage to change the world for the better somehow. And Absolutely. And it's, it's thanks to people like you and, and, and now, right? Thank you so much for organizing this. I'm, I'm super happy to, you know, bring the Vietnam situation before, you know, the more people that know about um, this injustice, the, the greater hope we have to fix things. Exactly. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you, Will. Just as a quick point of order, we'll be posting this video on YouTube. It's already on Facebook and we'll post it on all social media so you can share it with all of your friends, colleagues, families, and people you encounter in the streets. And uh, you can push people to take action as a result. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Will. All right. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.